The following is a presentation of the University of St. Thomas, with campuses in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the St. Thomas Alumni Relations Webinar Series. My name is Jenna Johnson, and I am a Program Manager in the Alumni Relations Office. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes. The last five minutes of the webinar will be used as a questions and answer session with Dr. Artika Tyner. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Atika Tyner. Dr. Tyner is a passionate educator, author, sought-after speaker, and advocate for justice. At the University of St. Thomas, Dr. Tyner serves as the Associate Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion. She is committed to training students to serve as social engineers who create new inroads to justice and freedom. Tyner received her BA from Hamlin University with a major in English and a Certificate of Conflict Studies. Due to her passion for advocating for social justice and educational policy reform, she decided to pursue graduate studies at the University of St. Thomas. She began her journey with law school since she recognized that the law is a language of power and therefore she sought to become well-versed in the law. Also in 2017, Dr. Tyner was named the American Small Business Champion. Subsequently, Dr. Tyner earned a Master's of Public Policy and Leadership in order to gain tools for affecting social change through policy reform efforts. Later, she inspired by the legacy of W.E.B. DuBose, she obtained a doctorate in leadership. Her doctoral studies provided her with key tools for serving in her community and promoting social justice. Dr. Tyner is committed to empowering others to lead within their respective spheres of influence. She provides leadership development and career coaching for young professionals. She also developed leadership ex educational materials for K-12 students, college graduate students, faith communities, and nonprofits. Additionally, Dr. Tyner teaches leadership coursework on ethics, critical reflection, and organizational development. Her research focuses on diversity and inclusion, community development, and civil rights. She has presented her research and conducted leadership training programs both nationally and internationally. Dr. Tyner leads by example by organizing policy campaigns, fostering restorative justice practices, developing social entrepreneurship initiatives, and promoting asset-based community development. She serves as a global citizen by supporting education, entrepreneurship, and women's leadership initiatives in Africa. I just had the opportunity to chat with Dr. Tyner for a few minutes before this webinar started, and I have to say, personally, she is one of the most amazing women I've ever met. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Artika Tyner. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the warm welcome. I'm excited today to talk a bit about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is addressing and eradicating the pathway to mass incarceration. But instead of just talking about the issue, I also want to give us an opportunity to talk about what we can do and how we can make an impact. And to start, I think one of the most important pieces is to have a backdrop. So I'm going to start with some of the statistics around the overview of trends in incarceration. So as you can read here in the red highlighted areas, it shows you that between 1972 and fast forwarding to today, that America has the highest rate of incarceration in the world with over 2 million people who are incarcerated. And according to Michelle Alexander, when we see that peak from 1972 of fast forwarding to today of 2017, and the peak between 1972 and the uh, mid-1980s, we definitely see a contributing factor as the war on drugs and the increase of incarceration. But also, I hope to give you a little homework. As a professor, I'd be remiss. I encourage you to take a moment to read and engage in Michelle Alexander's work and pick up a copy of her uh, seminal piece, The New Jim Crow. So with that, let's take a closer look. As we look closer, one of the things that we start to see is the social impact of mass incarceration. And in fact, if you look in that bottom left-hand corner, you might be thinking, what does Sesame Street have to do with mass incarceration? As you take a look here, this young man's name is Alex. Alex is here with the blue hair. Alex had, and his father was incarcerated. And one of the reasons why I like to bring up this issue is the social impact of mass incarceration is because sometimes we miss looking at the silent victims of mass incarceration, which are the children. Now, you can look at the data here, but I think it's important to be more specific to Minnesota. We have 15,000 children in Minnesota who have an incarcerated parent. It gives us an opportunity for me, as I go out to schools and as I make connections in the community, to also talk about some of the challenges that children may be facing that you're not aware of. And getting to the root causes, sometimes I hear, you know, behavioral specialists and teachers saying, you know, this child's having a bad day at school. Some of the challenges that I give them is to learn more about the child's background and experience to be able to provide the resources that they need to thrive both in and outside of the classroom. 
So this is just a note of something to think about, that it's not just talking about those who are incarcerated, but the peripheral uh, family members who are impacted as well. But the next layer to this that I would like to take a look at specifically is the impact on communities of color. Now on the left-hand side, you get an introduction to this idea called Jim Crow, which occurred from 1876 to the mid-1960s. You see a, a racial caste system emerging. But I'd like to pause here just with a brief question. And it is during Jim Crow, which amendment allowed for convict leasing? I know I can't hear you specifically, but you may be wondering. It actually was the 13th Amendment, which reads, neither slavery, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And you might be saying, pause, Dr. Tyner, time out. What does all that mean? What it really means then, you're seeing then the end of slavery, but you're seeing the opening of an opportunity to criminalize behavior that would serve as another entry point back into another form of enslavement and what we call today of the new Jim Crow and looking at mass incarceration. So then the follow-up question that I love to ask audiences as well is what was the name of the codes which led to the criminalization of members of the African American community for minor infractions like talking too loud, loitering, standing and congregating with others, and being unemployed. The irony of these things, these were actually a part of black codes that then, once again, when we want to talk about the entry point to convict leasing and looking at some of the challenges around criminality today, we see the black codes emerging as something that puts those who are formerly enslaved back into a new form of slavery. That fast forward to today, on the right-hand column, we have this concept as the new Jim Crow, that the U.S. imprisons a larger percentage of its uh, black population in South Africa during the, heart of apart uh, during the height of apartheid. But also you see the data that shows today that there are more African-American males under the control of our penal system than who were enslaved in the 1800s. So we get then into the discourse related to what Dr. Cornell West refers to as race matters. And how does race matter in light of the disproportionate impact on communities of color? I think the next slide really gives us the visual to see this in live and living color. So for those of us who are visual learners or need to get a greater sense of what this data really means, the top half gives you a sense of looking at the experience of males in our society. The bottom half, and actually this is a half that has been oftentimes ignored, but also a population growth in the number of women who are incarcerated today. But if you follow this uh, orange or red figure, you see the disparities. You see, for instance, for white males for incarceration, one in 17, one in three for black males, and for Latino males, one in six. And then going down to the bottom line, one in 111 white females, one in 18 black females, and one in 45 Latino women. So as we think about this, we also, it begs a question, and this is where it gets complex for some, but I hope to dispel some myths right here. The easy answers when you see this data, and I've taken this data across the nation and the world, is okay, well, people of color commit crime at a higher rate. The other responses that I hear is that people of color have a higher rate of drug use. And last but not least, the most interesting of them all, is that people of color may have some type of genetic makeup that makes them more in tune to criminality. I have to give you the answer that in dispelling myths, I'd love to be a myth buster, all three of them are false, false, and false. So that leads us to a deeper conversation to think about what are some of the root causes and contributing factors to this disproportionate rate that increases the lifetime likelihood of future imprisonment. So what can we do? We can leave the conversation and saying, Dr. Tyner painted this picture that uh, looks terrible, there's nothing we can do, and isn't it a shame? I just had some new data that I received in a webinar. Um, unfortunately, that's not the perspective that I would take. I use the data to give us a bit of a groundwork to work from and to see more closely the issue. But now here's a chance of asking that question of what's in the, your hands to make a difference in the world, of rolling up your sleeves and making an impact. I want to provide us with eight strategies that we all can use to make an impact. So let's dive in. The first one is a call to leadership. And when I think about a call to leadership, more specifically, I have this image here of Miss Freedom Fighter Esquire. I call that my inner superhero. But really, it's Wonder Woman with a law degree and an afro. 
And that's really what I wanted. That was my childhood dream, to be a gladiator for justice. I hope you can see me more clearly now on how I could use my education as a tool to advance social change. Now, I've been blessed with the opportunity to be a Tommy times three, to use my St. Thomas education to become that type of morally responsible leader, and I've used it to really redefine leadership. So when we think about redefining leadership, it's moving beyond just a position or a title or about power to really the portion of looking at uh, the redefining leadership to focus on how we create ideas, how we have a vision for justice, and really, how will we leave the world a better place than how we found it? So my challenge for you today is, what type of leader are you? What's your vision? What do you seek to impact? So my second strategy is something very specific. So these are for some of our Tommies who are business owners, some of our Tommies who are entrepreneurs, some of our Tommies that are in key leadership roles and have the ability to create opportunities. So pop quiz. Our region, meaning the Twin Cities Metro, uh, ranks number blank out of 25 of the largest U.S. metros, and, and we're looking at uh, a color gap around the job placement. So between whites who are non-Hispanic and people of color, ages 16 to 64. So what does this data really say? That our region ranks towards the bottom, number 23 out of 25, with one of the largest unemployment gaps between people of color and whites in our jurisdiction. What does that mean to me? It actually set me on a research journey. I had the opportunity to meet a woman by the name of Miss Jackie. She stands in front of the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee each day and protesting and saying the museum really does not reflect the legacy of Dr. King. And she kept saying, and I, it just spoke to my spirit, she kept saying this thing that poverty is violence. And I kept thinking to myself, I've never heard that before. But by the 10th time she said it, I was awakened to say, let me look at this more closely. So, of course, you know what I did. I started some research. And what I found was actually our uh, friend Aristotle gave us some views. He said, poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. Poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. So, when we think about this, and think about it in the context of mass incarceration, we have an opportunity for both prevention and intervention, that by creating jobs and making a commitment to ending poverty, we can also address some of the root causes of mass incarceration. But here's one little fun fact to take with you as well from our friends at the ITASCA project. We lose over $500 million in new state and local tax revenue by not increasing the diversity and inclusion of our workforce. So when you think about that, whether it's a moral interest or a business interest on why you're engaged and why are, you, why are you participating in this webinar, it creates an opportunity to think about the socioeconomic impact of not taking a proactive approach to what? Ending poverty, if it's the parent of crime and revolution. And so next, as we take a closer look, I want to give you a sense of this is a little civil rights tidbit for you. But this is the March for Jobs and Freedom. And if we look at this, you know this is one of the areas where Dr. King had a tremendous impact and he gave his uh, articulation of what his dream would be. But there was also another great voice that elevated this process of bringing socioeconomics to the forefront of an idea of what is financial inclusion. And this is the voice of A. Philip Randolph. He said, a community is democratic only when the humblest and weakest person can enjoy the highest civil, economic, and social rights that the biggest and most powerful possess. So he was early on getting to what are some of the root causes of challenges in our community if not having an, the same access and equal access and an equity proposition around jobs and opportunities. So specifically when we look at poverty, I want to take it back to the children. And when we look at the children, look at child poverty, we have on the left-hand side a quote here from Marion Wright Edelman that reminds us if we don't stand up for children, then we don't stand for much. So when we think about, I talked about children as some of the silent victims, but I also think, and I'll talk about it later in the presentation as well, but we also have to create opportunities for children early on to create alternative pathways, not a pathway to mass incarceration or the school to prison pipeline, but a pathway to upward mobility, self-determination, and a pathway to success. 
But I think it's important for us to also know how are the children and to beg that question. So with the first blank there, the blank number of children who live in poverty nationally, so we give that answer, it's nearly 15 million children who live in poverty nationally. And then for the second data point, we oftentimes talk about this in the abstract as a global dilemma, but 6.5 million children live in extreme poverty nationally here in the United States. Now, if we look at it from a global indicator, typically someone says that's living on less than $2 a day. If we look at it related to extreme poverty in the U.S., it's specifically looking at children whose only source of income for their families is related to public assistance. And the second piece, uh, number of children who live in poverty in, in Minnesota, now we've had a decline, and so the current rate has gone down by 33,000 young people, but still something that we have to think about, 165,000 young people live in poverty in Minnesota. So that might be the child that you interact with at your child's school, out in the park, or in the community. And when we think about poverty, once again, we have to think about how poverty can limit access to opportunities. So that's an equal opportunity gap as well. So what can we do about this piece? The, second strat or the third strategy that we're going to take a look at serves as a natural bridge. We can promote educational opportunities. And I just want to highlight just a few data points and actually another piece of homework. I love giving homework. You can tell the professor in me is waking up even though I didn't have my coffee yet. But here we are for promoting educational opportunities. NPR did an extensive study over the past year looking at some of the educational disparities in the state of Minnesota. You can download it from their website. They looked at two indicators. I'm going to focus on them, the fourth grade reading scores and also graduation rates. For both of them, clearly we have work to do. Now, if we look at the data then, let's look at it a different way because I have it listed 79% of African American boys, 77% of Hispanic and Native American boys are reading below uh, proficiency levels. So what does that look like as a data and statistic? Only a fourth of young people, young men of color, are reading at grade level. Now, if you take both boys and girls, it's only about a third that are reading at grade level. So these are some opportunities for us to think about then, more specifically, because fourth grade reading levels, in some instances, there are arguments that there's a correlation between illiteracy and future incarceration. But here's a data point that we know with certainty that if you're not reading proficiently at fourth grade, you're more likely to drop out of school, four times more likely. So as we think about that statistic within itself, we have an opportunity to engage young people and we have an obligation to address the issue of literacy. For graduation rates, I think more specifically we should focus on some of the data that NPR published. And what we'll see then, out of 50 states, Minnesota ranks at the bottom, either 48th or 49th, at the rate of graduation on time graduations for uh, students of color. So when we think about this and making the connection back to poverty, back to opportunities, we know that we have work to do. So this leads us into another area of my work in research and disrupting the school to prison pipeline. And for additional context related to this issue, I encourage you to visit the websites of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and also visit the website of the Advancement Project. So you may be wondering, what is the school to prison pipeline? How does that relate to some of the issues that we're seeing today? Because if we look at mass incarceration, and I always love to give a visual, I characterize mass incarceration as a tangled web with far too many entry points and far fewer exit points. Fast forward to today, one of the entry points is schools. If we look at the, in the state of Minnesota, a nearly a quarter of the juvenile cases that come into our docket are referred from schools. And if we look at the data, nationally it's shown us that the path from the classroom to the courtroom increases the likelihood of future incarceration. So you may be wondering, Dr. Tyner, what exactly are you saying? How does this connect to a conversation about mass incarceration? That now we have a phenomenon where schools can be one of the entry points into this tangled web of mass incarceration. So let's just put it into context then. Every second and a half, a child is referred out of the classroom related to a suspension or expulsion. That's enough children for my football lovers out there to fill every NFL stadium combined and there will still be kids standing outside. 
So you may be saying, well, Dr. Tyner, we're going to get into one of those myth busters again. I, I love those. And if we look at the disproportionate rate at which students of color are referred out of the classroom, once again, the easier answer is, well, students of color have more behavioral issues in the classroom. I think we need to engage the data and we will see a different answer. We will, in fact, see that most of the opportunities when children of color are referred out of the classroom are related to more subjective categories in the sense of, in some instances, other behavioral issues potentially, or in these broad cases of even, there's some data that says primarily for students of color, and this is when you're getting to more of the high school age, the primary conviction is related to uh, truancy. So my hope is that we don't simply just once again negate peeling back the layers to find out why we have a disproportionate rate of children of color entering into the school to prison pipeline, but also to ask the broader question of why and how. And actually I'll pause here because then some people say, well, it's, how relevant is that? When I was a kid, there was a school fight and you know, maybe a child's referred to the school principal and the parents come. Things have changed in some ways. Most high schools have a school resource officer or a police officer on staff. In most instances, then, when you're entering into the juvenile justice system for an offense that happened on school grounds, you also have to look at the ramifications of what does it mean of entering, and that's why I have the diagram on the end from the classroom to the courtroom to future incarceration. What are the outcomes of having an interaction with the juvenile justice system at an early age? So we know that takes me to the next point, incarceration as a child is one of the biggest predictors of future incarceration in adult corrections. So we, when we look at this, it's one of those things that make you go, hmm, but I hope it's one of those things that also helps you to beg a few questions. But I think it would be uh, interesting to throw a couple sidebars here that we should be aware of as well. When we look at the cost of incarceration, this is one of the things that stood out to me. In the state of Minnesota, uh, annual incarceration is upwards of $41,000. Now, when we look at then how much we're investing in schools, national data has shown us that we invest nearly four times as much, nearly four times more in incarceration than we do in the public education of our K-12 students. So it also begs the question of priorities, of value, and what is the impact in those societal questions of what is the future of a society with this tangled web of mass incarceration that even starts at the K through 12 level. But here's the added twist to it. It doesn't just start at the K through 12 level. We're also seeing this disproportionate rate of referral out the classroom at the preschool level. There's actually a parent advocate by the name of Tunette Powell. She was featured in the Huffington Post, uh, raising the question of why was her preschooler continually suspended and referred out of the classroom. It's another homework assignment for you to take a look at some of the challenges that she raised in that article. But in fact, one of the things that she talked about as we move to strategy five was the need to address implicit bias. Now I'm starting here to give you a sense of implicit bias of how it impacts the criminal justice system. In 1993, the Supreme Court commissioned the Race Bias Task Force to take a specific look at what happens in the criminal process. Now, long story short, you will see, just based upon the data, that there were challenges from the point of contact with law enforcement all the way up to the final disposition and sentencing that race bias played a role. When we look at, and we can go back to my earlier statement on some of those myths, that the myth buster exercise we had early on, there were perceptions that people of color, once again, were committing more crimes, more violent, more severe crimes, and just looking at crime happening only in communities of color, some of these broad sweeping statements. But really the reality was, when we started to unpeel the layers, we saw inequities from that starting point all the way to the end, which created an opportunity to talk more specifically about what is implicit bias. How does it impact our decision making? How does it impact the administration of justice? So here's something that you can also do in your spare time. There's a study that's available for you free of charge, and I like the word free when I'm thinking about assessment and learning tools. You can take the implicit association test, and what that can provide for you is an opportunity to explore more closely and learn more about yourself. Because I think a part of 
what we have to do as a society, as a nation, as we're thinking about uh, race bias or gender bias, is looking closely at that, as Michael Jackson would say, that man or that woman in the mirror, and try to figure out how our beliefs, customs, rituals, and myths were formulated. An IAT, that Implicit Association Test, provided by Harvard, gives you an opportunity to look more closely. So that's one of the strategies that we've been using uh, in our work specifically with attorneys to engage and see how implicit bias impacts the administration of justice. Next up, number six, engage in policy reform. Now that's something we all can do. That's something that we all can do based upon our voice, based upon our advocacy as citizens. So I'm just giving us just a few points. There are plenty more, and you can definitely contact me as well to explore other ways that you can engage in policy reform. But the first one that I'd like to talk about is the ending of prison gerrymandering. And you may be thinking, what in the world does that mean? That sounds like a pretty strong legalese. But really what it's about is an ongoing issue that we have to take a look at. It's based upon the U.S. Census data. So specifically, what it does, based upon the Census Bureau, is you've gotten those surveys, you're counting you know, the number of individuals that live in your household based upon your jurisdiction, but here's really the simplistic piece of it. Based upon that data, that determines how resources are allocated to communities based upon federal aid. And let's just look at it in simple logic then. If individuals who are in prison, those over two million people potentially, are then accounted for in the jurisdiction where they're incarcerated, what happens to the community where they really have residency when they're returning back home? Those communities, let's take it to its logical end, have some of the same challenges that they face when that person was incarcerated when they come back, and even less resources to deal with some of the challenges that one of our, and I love the term that uh, one of my mentors uses, Dr. Khan, when someone's a homecomer returning back home, returning back home to a circumstance that's either worse or the same. So when we think about that data and the federal aid, my hope would be that additional aid, additional resources are allocated in this jurisdiction where someone has come from, not where they're currently uh, residing in the sense of being incarcerated. Now that's a deeper conversation, but I think those are the things that will cause us to challenge myths and narratives and also ask the critical questions of how can we ensure that each individual has an equal opportunity to thrive in their community with simple things, those basic Maslow hierarchy of needs of housing, jobs, and stability. Promote, restore the vote. Now this particular piece of legislation has come before the Minnesota legislature multiple times. Over 40,000 Minnesotans live in our communities each and every day and are unable to participate in one of the fundamental rights around our Constitution and around who we say we are as a democratic society, the right to vote, rock the vote. So you're not able to vote based upon being on the terms of probation or parole or in the street vernacular we say on paper. So when we think about that, my hope is that we can think about this critically in a number of different ways. Because first, the research shows us that an important part of reintegration and coming back home and being a homecomer is being actively involved in the democratic process. So some things to think about. And last but not least, addressing collateral consequences. And I know when I say that, most people are like, what's that? That's why we're going to the next slide to give you a glimpse of what it is. Collateral consequences. When you have a criminal conviction, it's more than the sanction more than just doing time. This is just a short list of some of the issues that people face when they come back home. This is after someone served their sentence, paid their debt to society, they are still facing these hidden barriers, which Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, refers to as a parallel universe. And being a parallel universe, what exactly does that mean? Coming back home and to a society with the rules, with the customs, with the practices that you can't engage in, that you return back home with a permanent scarlet letter of F for felon that gives you a great gift of a lack of opportunities is outlined on this particular slide. In fact, in the state of Minnesota, there are over 22 collateral sanctions outlined in Minnesota law, ranging from everything from becoming a school bus driver to working at a pharmacy. And coupled with that, let's, talk, let's bring it back to employment. 
A national study showed that two-thirds of employers reported that they would not hire a former offender. So when we look at this, this is really a call to action. My last two strategies are about what we can really do. Number seven is about that village approach. When we talk about creating a village, that includes all of us. And when we think about that, I bring up the example here of Father Gregory Boyle, who said nothing stops a bullet like a job. So one of the things that he raised, and his article was featured in Time magazine, what happens when gang violence becomes a community health issue, not a crime problem? I would take that a step further. What happens when the school to prison pipeline becomes a community health issue and not a crime problem? What happens when the war on drugs becomes a community health issue and not a crime problem? I think that would give us new solutions, new ideas, and new ways for engagement. The last strategy, last but not least, I think this is more of a deeper philosophical question. And as fellow Tommies, we must beg this question. If we state our mission and we say that we're training the next generation of morally responsible leaders for our current students, but for our alumni, faculty, and staff, we are supposed to be those morally responsible leaders. So that's asking us, what does all this mean in light of what we can do to make an impact? What does it mean, and I have Dr. King quoted here, of looking at the interrelatedness of the experience of being a part of the human family that draws us all in with the responsibility to think through the issues of mass incarceration and try to deconstruct and dismantle the tangled web of mass incarceration. So I end here with the words of Diane Nash, which we have the benefit of actually hearing from her in person just a few weeks ago during the Black Empowerment Student Association annual gala. And one of the things that she was quoted in, in saying, and you see this picture here of the Freedom Riders uh, singing together the songs of freedom, I only can imagine. Maybe they were singing songs like, we are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Or maybe they were singing songs like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Or better yet, maybe they were singing, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. But no matter the song, I think Diane Nash's words rings true, that freedom is people realizing they are their own leaders. So I'm asking this question as a statement and question all in one on both sides. For those who are listening to me and hearing the sound of my voice, I hope you will be a leader, that you'll share the information that you've learned today, that you'll ask yourself some critical questions. What did I think about mass incarceration? Was it a myth? Was it true what I believed? And what, the most important question, what can I do to make a difference in the world? Thank you, Dr. Tyner, so much for your insight and wonderful presentation. We truly appreciate it. We are now going to open up the question and answer session. In the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a text box. Feel free to send in any questions you have, and Dr. Tyner will get to as many as she can today. The first question that was sent in is, I have heard all of these things, but what can I do? In other words, what is one small action I can take today? That's a perfect question for the segue of thinking about how to make leadership really come alive. So when I think about that, what's one small action you can do today? I talked about the children. Maybe it's getting more involved in your school and thinking about even a support group or resources for children who have an incarcerated parent. Because based upon the research, children with an incarcerated parent experience something that's been called a vicarious loss. It's very similar to a grieving process of a death of a parent, but that's reoccurring and never has true closure. So when you think about that, are there resources for some of those silent victims of mass incarceration in your schools? Are there opportunities within your organization? Now, I know there are state laws, and I know there are national you know, recommendations and policies on hiring and ensuring you're not engaging in hiring discrimination because someone has a criminal record. The reality is that discrimination happens each day. So when we think about that, I hope that you also can be an advocate in search committees and in hiring to ensure that we truly create equal access to opportunities. Also, you can lift your voice, lift your voice for justice in that way of engaging yourself in advocacy around the public policy pieces. I know I gave three examples, but can you be an advocate for increased resources for job development? Can you get involved to ensure one of the other things, supporting more opportunities and funding for education? supporting a literacy program in your school, but building opportunities and having the conversation. And more importantly, oftentimes I hear people say, well, I'm, you know, I'm an ally and here I am to support. I challenge you to be an abolitionist because an ally is a one-on-one -on -one interaction. 
I challenge you to be the type of abolition that says we are going to end mass incarceration, we're going to deconstruct the system, and we're going to ensure that everyone has an equal chance to thrive in our society. So instead of just the ally language, I challenge you, even go to your Webster Dictionary tonight, look up ally versus abolitionist. And what you'll see is in being an abolitionist, you're deconstructing and changing systems and system change. You'll be a world changer. Be an abolitionist for justice. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Tyner. The next question is, how do you recommend we respond to AG Sessions' recent directive to federal prosecutors to seek maximum sentencing rolling back Obama-era changes? I recommend two things, being informed and engaged. I appreciate the question in particular because that means someone's been following the issues. And I also challenge you then to follow the data. The data clearly shows us what works and what doesn't work. We can look at the data in the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, whichever administration. The data we can see is that if we peel back and repeal some of the efforts that we made around drug sentencing, mandatory minimums, it doesn't yield the result that we say it does. If we say that harsher penalties help to address and end crime, but the data shows us that that's not the answer. And Aristotle, who hasn't been alive during my lifetime, has told us that if we look at poverty as a parent of crime and revolution, we have some of the answers in front of us. So I think it's an opportunity to be an advocate and be an advocate for justice, contacting your elected officials, getting involved, getting engaged with groups like Take Action Minnesota, the Isaiah Project here locally, organizing the local faith communities, even in our own clinic here, the Community Justice Project. So I think it's an opportunity to get informed and engage and do what works. I mean, it's one thing to say this is Dr. Tyner's opinion. It's another thing to say that we have the data and we know what works. And it's another thing to say we've seen this already and here's an opportunity to create change. So thank you for the question and I thank you in advance for being an advocate for justice. Wonderful. The next question is, are there national groups or resources with whom to partner with in beginning to engage these strategies you talked about? Some of the national groups that I love, and I, I'm a little biased here, but I, I definitely would have to say I'm in the, I want to be the number one fan of Brian Stevenson and his work of the Equal Justice Initiative. He's really been working specifically on combating issues related to the disparities in the criminal justice system, but I think he's doing something deeper. He's doing a social revolution to say, I am my brother's and my sister's keeper. So as a society, we have to look critically at the action and inaction that we take in order to manifest a change. You also can follow the work of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I also had mentioned earlier the Advancement Project as another tool, the Urban League, but I also want to take us local. I also serve on the board of a group called and a nonprofit organization, Ujama Place. We're always looking for opportunities for the community to engage with the men who have returned back home and are looking to be engaged and connected to their community. Now, once again, when you talk about data and what data shows, what data shows then, based upon our work with the Ujama men and our transformational model and theory of change, that these men, when given the opportunity, make a conscious choice to build a family, to build a house, to build a career, and build a lifetime of change if given the right opportunity. So also join us in our work in Ujama Place locally. Wonderful. The next question is, what is St. Thomas doing um, to help first-generation college students and students of color? What is St. Thomas doing? I think a part of it is creating opportunities both inside and outside of the classroom. But let's start with one of the first pieces. I think one of the great opportunities that we'll have in this upcoming fall is with the launch of our new two-year college to create opportunities for students to help bridge that gap and earn their associate's degree at an affordable cost and that affordable cost is currently budgeted at $1,000 or less. But here's what I really want to focus on, is the rigor of the curriculum, also the internship opportunities, because those are the practical experiences that bridge the gap. Because I am in both of those categories. As a first-generation, low-income student, student of color, many people will say that's a triple threat, and or triple bind in particular of challenges. But it really was an opportunity to thrive. So we partner with organizations like the Page Education Foundation to offer scholarship for their students. And I also have to make sure that I 
salute Justice Page, who was recently recognized with our Outstanding Commitment Award, we have the largest number of Page Scholars out of the other private colleges in the state. And what the Page Scholar Opportunity provides, not just a scholarship, but the role modeling, the resources and tools to be a servant leader. So we've also been par very actively partnering with the Page Education Foundation. And I also would say one of the areas where I hope that we can continue to grow is in this premise of inclusive excellence, of creating opportunities for students to have the support and the resources that they need to thrive academically. So expanding our resources around academic support, expanding our resources around mentorship and engagement, and also, this is the last point that I'll make, expanding the opportunities around role modeling. Because that's the that nature of you can't be what you can't see. So I try to embody that myself as the first person in my family to graduate from college. That meant, of course, I was the first person to become a lawyer, first person to earn my master's, the first person to earn my doctorate. I mean, it was to the point, I think some of my relatives still you know, think that I have an MD, and so they're like, oh, I'm, what do you think about my medication? I'm like, what are you talking about? So when I think about that, it was even dispelling the myth within my own family of what it meant to earn my degrees. And what it really meant to me is being tooled with the tools to be a change maker. So when I think about that, I hope that not only myself, but throughout our entire community, that we role model and create opportunities that the students can be the best that they can be without any barrier set in front of them. Thank you, Dr. Tanner. The next question is, how did you become interested in the topic of mass incarceration? For me, oftentimes that topic for a lot of scholars is in the abstract. They'll say they studied this, they studied that. For me, it was up close and personal. I was that kid that I was talking about in the data. I mean, I saw and I was just trying to do some rough estimates of data just a, about a week ago that collectively just, you know, for my aunts and uncles, they probably spent between 50 to 70 years incarcerated during the peak of the war on drugs, whether it's conspiracy charges based upon these mandatory minimums. So for me, it's not an abstract thing. For me, it's my life. So when I think about the power of me being an educator, it's the opportunity to bring life to the classroom, to ignite a passion and use our research, our analytical, our writing tools, and our voice. I know one of our community leaders, he always says, if you got voice, you got power. So I started to get my voice aligning with my passion and with my faith to make an impact. So for me, this was my life. I watched it silently, and I, I must admit, I didn't start talking about these issues to probably about four or five years ago. But this was my life because there was that sense of embarrassment. Like, how can you go to, you know, having coffee? Like, let's talk about mass incarceration, not as an academic pursuit, but as a life pursuit then coupled with academics and scholarship. So for me, this is my life. This is my reality. Wonderful. Um, that is the last question we have today. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Tyner for being here. Um, I'll turn it over to say farewell as well. Thank you for joining in. I hope that this is the beginning of a process and a journey of exploration of mass incarceration, but also thinking critically on how you can make an impact. Thank you for joining the Justice League along with me.